So, uh, where we had left off, we were talking a little bit about our um, about our sumo additions here. We were talking about our sumo additions, and we had talked about what's happening, right, when we uh, add a halogen in the presence of some weakly nucleophilic, right, some kind of weakly nucleophilic salt, like water, right? And what we had said is that the mechanism starts the same way, right? The halogen adds to the pi bond. We make our bromonium intermediate, our three-membered ring with the positive charge, all that kind of stuff, right? And then we said, in this case, the water is going to come in and pop open that ring. Why does the water come in and do that? Hmm? Yeah, it's a nucleophile, right? Do you guys get the point? Any nucleophile can really come in and pop open this ring. You guys got it? Why does the water do it and not the bromine in this case? Because it's a solvent, right? Statistically, it's around more than the Br- is. Can the Br- still come and do the ring opening here? Absolutely, but it'd be considered a minor product, right? You guys with me on that one? Right? I'm not saying that doesn't happen, it's just statistically it won't happen as often, okay? Remember, this ring opening here is SN2-like, right? It's SN2-ish. It comes in from the other end of wherever the other stuff leaves from. You guys follow me on that one? And remember, we talked about that concentration, right? Increasing concentration speeds up the SN2 reactions, right? So all we're doing here is we're maximizing <laughs> We're maximizing our concentration of our nucleophile by making it the solvent. Got it? You guys with me on this one? Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, you guys got something else in your mind? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask you a really difficult question that's completely unrelated. You guys ready? No, no, we got plenty of that already. <laughs> okay, so tell me what the product's going to be here. We'll make, we'll do Thanksgiving dinner together. <laughs> 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 oh, 
only attach those two cousins. You add an extra cousin. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But then, right, so just like what we talked about, uh, what was that? No, sir. Yeah, so just like what we talked about here, right, that's our solving. Right? So that's our solving. Right? Have we seen any carbo cations ever formed at this point? No. So go back and take a look at how this first step happened. Well, that bromonium energy has three numbers and intermediate. Okay? Um, good. Yep. So it's going to be the same way as water, right? What about functional group? What does it make it be? Right? That's the question. So just be careful where that's going to come back down. Remember, no, that's like how it's that weird little arrows there? With me on this one? What's up? Why weren't the uh, questions on the test spelled like this one? They're exactly like this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are, right? So, what happens in this mechanism? The mechanism is you form a bromonium intermediate, a three numbered ring intermediate. How does that alcohol act? Okay. You guys get the point that I'm making? The, the, the point of that, the point of your exam, the way you answer every question on that exam is saying, how does a mechanism behave? Not how does a mechanism behave if it's under these very specific conditions, right? The mechanisms on the exam all work this exact same way. They look complex. I wouldn't argue on that one. But guess how they're going to behave? Exactly the same way. So guess how every answer should look? Something like this, right? Okay. All going to work that same way. As I promised you guys in the instructions, I will not give you guys something on an exam that we haven't seen in class. The mechanisms are what we've seen in class, right? And those mechanisms are what's on the exam. So all your answers should be mechanisms that we've seen. So don't come up with new mechanisms. <laughs> right? that's, that's where points get taken off. You guys are like, well, I've never seen this in class, so I'm going to do this. Okay. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. They're scary looking. I got it. But I trust you guys. I believe you. Okay. So, question. What functional groups did we make here? Ester and ether, right? So we made an ether and we made an alkyl halide, right? How many ethers have we seen made so far? Well, not too many, right? Or have we? Uh, let's think here for a second then, okay? Do some problem solving skills. Oops. 
you guys can come up with a way how to make that. Remember, don't use anything that we've learned in class. Right? Come up with something completely different, right? Yep, thanks, Dr. H. <laughs> <laughs> Message received. <laughs> no, remember, you guys have all the answers. You just have to believe and know and look and assess. multiple ways to tackle this problem too, by the way. Just like the last two problems on the exam. I just told you how I did it. You guys could use more or less, right? Just telling you how I did it. got a
Okay. So. So there's my first step that I'm going to use, right? How can I do that step? What type of a reaction am I doing here in black? How do we know? All right, we're substituting one functional group for the other, right? So we're doing a substitution. What flavor of leaping group do we have to begin with? Primary. So what's our only substitution mechanism that works at primary? SN2. So we need to set this up for SN2 conditions, right? What are good conditions for SN2s? Strong nucleophile, okay. So we're trying to add this group in. How can we make an always strong nucleophile? By giving it a negative charge, right? And then hopefully we've seen this enough times at this point to kind of put those two together, right? But wait a minute, Dr. H. This is a strong base. Right? Is it a strong base? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can't do that. It's going to eliminate. Right? No. No. <laughs> Why not? Because, yeah, it is a strong base, but what is it? It's also a good nucleophile. And what's our leaving group? Primary, and what's favored at primary leaving groups? SN2. SN2. You guys got it? All right. There it is. Nice dive ether type complex. Looks weird, doesn't it? Why does it look weird? So what's useful about our, uh, or what's potentially useful about our uh, sumo mechanism? Well, where does it leave our bromine? The On the less substituted side, right? Is it easy to put things on a less substituted side? Usually not, right? But here we have another potential, right? We're putting a leaving group on a less substituted side. That's useful, right? Cool. All right. I'll give you guys a question that I wanted to put on the exam. How's that sound? Uh, no, we're good. what we know so far. How could we do that? I'll give you a hint. Not easily. <laughs> So as with everything in life, right? what's the most important thing to do first? Yeah. And then after you're done with that, then comes the crying, right? And then comes the other stages of grief, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. anger, bargaining, right? <laughs> okay? After you're done with all that, it's the most important thing you can do. Think. Okay? What do we see in our product? In addition, okay, that's important. What else do we see? We see that it's an addition. We know our first step has to be an addition, right? Because we start out with a pie bomb. That's important. What else? Let me let me let me back up for just a second and, and change Annie's thought for just a second. Both of the alcohols have to end up on the same side. It doesn't necessarily mean we add them both at the same time, right? We have a pi bond, right? What do we notice about those two alcohols in relation to each other? They're on the same side, what else? They're next to each other. How many mechanisms have we learned that add two functional groups next to each other? Just one. You guys get what I'm saying with this? Where the two functional groups are gives you an important clue. It tells you what? That likely along the way we had to do a addition that leaves two things next to each other, right? Our sumo. Got it? But wait a minute, Dr. H. You're full of crap. Because I know that my sumo mechanism add thing adds things how? Sumo mechanism always adds things how? Anti, right? Is that an important feature of a sumo mechanism? Absolutely. The incoming nucleophile adds from the opposite of whatever is getting kicked off and broken into ring extremely important. If we talk about that, it forms a racemic mixture. If something gets kicked off wedge, the incoming group comes in dashed, all this kind of stuff, right? So what evidence do we have here so far? We probably have to do a sumo, and we probably have to do it first. But we need an alcohol next to an alcohol. Well, do we have Do we have a way of adding those two alcohols directly in a sumo next to each other? Well, no, but we can add one alcohol in a sumo, right? If we have Br2 and Y. Sound good? Let's see what we can come up with then. So our thought so far is do this. up with something like that, right? If you do a S and two, will it come in dashed on ring? Come in. I mean wedged. Yeah. What do we know about S and twos? They add opposite of where the stuff is off. So we'd have to set up some kind of SN2 at that bromine. So we'd say, okay, easy peasy. Add some sodium hydroxide and water, right? And that seems logical for what we know so far, right? But there's a problem. This this actually makes a mess. Okay. So this won't work quite as expected for us, unfortunately. Okay. Now we're going to learn what that mess is in just a little bit. All right. But at the moment, this might be the best way we have of doing that. But we need to come up with a better way. Okay. So the next two reactions that we'll see are syn 
dihydroxylation reactions. So SYN dihydroxylations. Hydroxylation, there it is. Sin dihydroxylation. Got it. Easy every time. So guess what sin dihydroxylation reactions do? They add two hydroxies sin to each other. Got it? So they're going to do exactly what we want them to do. So let's see how we can set up these beasts. So we'll start with a nice pi bond. We're going to add in some OS O4. Some sodium sulfite and uh, water, right? Yeah, water. Yep. Okay. That's one of our ways of doing this. There's another way we have of doing this. AMNO4, okay, H2O, and keep it kind of cold, okay, oops, sorry, I forgot one thing, H2O, and, sorry, let me rewrite this, and AOH, H2O, and cold, okay, there it is. OSO4 over that yada yada yada. KMNO4 with that yada yada yada. Okay, so tell me about the yada yada yada. What do you guys know? What do you notice about these two reactions? What do they share in common or what are they different? Go ahead. They have four oxygen. Okay, so we have highly oxidized. What's OS? Yeah, is that what's on my code that makes it work? It's the I of that small one. <laughs> what's OS in terms of an element? So what you guys can <laughs> It's osmium, right? Where's osmium in our periodic table? Yeah. Um, it's in our transition metals. What's MN? Manganese. Where's manganese on the periodic table? Also a transition metal. Could you guys tell me what the oxidation states are for the metals? Uh, no, that's Gen Chem, sorry about that. <laughs> They're highly oxidized transition metals. They are fantastic oxidizing agents. They are good agents of oxidation, right? AKA they are going to add oxygens to carbons. Okay. Now both osmium tetroxide, OSO4, and potassium permanganate, KMNO4, they both share some traits in common. They're both tetrahedral-ish geometries, so they're going to behave similarly. Okay. The sodium sulfite, the Na2SO3, okay, that's a good reducing agent. Osmium tetroxide is pretty darn expensive, and that helps us to recover it afterwards. Not really part of the mechanism for what we care about, okay, but you'll see it in the book. KMNO4. NaOH and water, that's there to kind of facilitate this reaction going. The cold is important, okay? So 
So remember, just like what we talked about with our halogenation reactions, we keep our Br2 in the cold and dark, right? The same thing that's gonna be important here. KMnO4, when it's cold, does something different than when it's hot. We'll learn what happens when it's hot a little bit later, okay? The KMnO4 has a couple of different purposes. Yeah? Okay, so when, when we're doing that Br2, when it's kept cold and dark, yep. does that go for any halogen that's yep. that? Even more so when it's iodine. Okay. Yep. Iodine loves to react with the light. And so it'll, it'll, it'll go through. We, we definitely want to keep that in the dark. Okay. All right. So let me zoom in a bit here. Sort of zoom in. I'll just draw it bigger. Okay. okay. I don't need you guys to know this mechanism. I'm going to show you what's going on though, okay? Behold. Okay. This does that. Does this. It does that. So see if you guys can follow those arrows and draw what's going on. see happening here. So all of these blue arrows are happening at the same time. Okay? So what was it called when we have a or well this would be a concerted step, right? Where we add that MnO4 group to the alkene. What do we know to, what do we know about alkenes? Some of the properties that we know about alkenes. They're planar. So how is this MnO4 going to add? They have it has to add on the same side. The two oxygens has to add on the same side. Got it? Because if you think about it, if you try and do it in your head, right, you can't add oxygens to opposite side of an MnO4, excuse me, of an alkene at the same time. Okay? Not gonna happen. So typically addition reactions, we see them more frequently as sin additions if we see a step like this where the two things are added at the same time. Can you guys think of another sin addition that we've mentioned? Hydrogenation, right? What did we say about our hydrogenation? The hydrogens get added at the same time to the same phase. Huh, interesting. I wonder if that might be useful on an exam or something. Well, who knows, right? But anyway, right? So we have these two oxygens that are added, right, to the same phase. The osmium works in essentially the same way, okay? You're gonna see the same set of arrows that would happen for the osmium. And then everyone's favorite mechanism happens after this. Well, maybe your second favorite mechanism. What's the favorite mechanism you guys have learned so far? Eh, hydrohalogenation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your favorite mechanism that you guys have easily memorized so far? Magic. All right, you guys remember that step? I guess it wasn't everyone's favorite. Uh, so somehow these, somehow these, uh, that metal is going to pop off there. I don't really care about that, right? 
But what I do want you guys to think about, the oxygens here are bound to the same side. Okay, so we have this kind of weird five-membered ring intermediate, right? With the two oxygens interacting with the two carbons of the pi bond there. Okay. The really important thing is that we start to recognize, as you guys told me, okay, that alkenes are planar. And when we add things, we see them added at the same time to the same face. Okay? That's why the bromonium happens, right? We add the bromine to one side, okay? And then the incoming nucleophile adds from the opposite side, okay? So, after we do our workup with water and sodium hydroxide and we keep it cold, right? So to bring this back, KMnO4, NaOH, cold, dark, no, not dark, sorry, um, red wine, habits. Our answer will be this. Easy peasy. You add two hydroxies next door to each other to the carbons that were involved in the pi bond. That's it. don't even have to know the first part of it. It's just there to show you guys that it's added at the same time. The purpose of me talking about the first part is to remind you guys that alkene addition can be sin or anti, right? And if we add the two things at the same time, it has to be sin. Good? Osmium and the KMnO4 will work the same way. different. Now we look at something called ozonalysis. Ozonalysis. So we're going to use ozone and we're going to lysis something with it. Okay? So you biology people, what does it mean to lyse something? Break it open. So guess what's going to happen here? We're going to break it open. What are we going to break open? The ring, but specifically the pi bond, okay? So in O's analysis, you're going to clip a pi bond and open it up, okay? In fact, you're gonna completely clip it open. So, we're going to learn, uh, I'm going to show you guys a, I'll call it a pseudo mechanism. All right, this is one of Dr. H, Dr. H's mechanisms, all right, that people stole from me, jerks, okay, and then I'll show you guys what kind of happens behind the scenes. Uh, because this is a pseudo mechanism, and because the mechanism I'll show you guys is only specific to this reaction, I don't need you guys to know it. And I will never ask you guys this mechanism on an exam. Got it? That's what I mean by that stuff. If I say you don't have to know it, I'm not going to ask you guys on an exam. Doesn't mean that the reaction isn't useful. Doesn't mean that the reaction can't be found on an exam, that kind of stuff. Right? So here's the mechanism. It's got three parts. You snip, you slide, and you slap. Okay? It's called the snip, slide, slap. Here's how it works. So to zoom in again, when we do a snip slide slap, what we do is we snip our double bond. Okay? We snip our double bond in half. We 
we slide the double bond, we slide the two halves apart, okay? And we slap oxygens at the end of each pi bond. That's it. You snip the double bond, you slide it apart, and you slap some oxygens in there. I used to just call it the snip and slap, but that's not nearly as marketable as the snip, slide, and slap, right? Either one you guys want to know. Okay. What did we make? So let's clean this up and make it look nice and pretty. Oops, sorry, those should be red. There it is. Okay, what in the world happened? What did we do? To oxygens, right? Yeah. What else? A couple of really unique things about this reaction that we haven't been able to do so far. We've never been able to break the ring. We've only ever been able to like either shrink it or expand it. We've never been able to break a carbon-carbon bond before, right? So we completely split apart a carbon-carbon bond. So ozonalysis is useful for chewing apart carbon-carbon bonds. Okay. So what functional group did we make? Mm, not ketone, a little close though, but a hydrogen on one side and a carbon on the other. What do they use to preserve dead animals and stuff like that? Formaldehydes, right? So this is an aldehyde, right? How many reactions have we seen that make aldehydes? Just one, right? You guys with me? A pretty unique reaction here. Cut things apart, break it open, chew apart double bonds, make aldehydes. We can make ketones also, depending on the uh, nature of the pi bond. Right? I'll show you guys what I mean in a sec. Pretty darn unique. This also explains why ozone is really bad for you know biological life. Do you guys have any double bonds inside your uh, you know DNA and stuff? Yeah. Do you think that this will happen if, it, if ozone encounters DNA? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, before I move on. So, uh, DMS. So, DMS is dimethyl sulfide, which is very close to DMS, oh, which is dimethyl sulf oxide. So, DMS is there as a reducing agent. Okay. It'll neutralize any residual ozone, this kind of stuff, and it'll become oxidized to DMSO. Okay. So it's there to clean things up. That's what its job is. You'll notice I've got a 1 and 2 in front of it there, right? What does that mean? You do one step, and then you do the second step. Okay. You don't throw it together at the same time, otherwise nothing happens. Okay. So be careful when you guys are putting together specific steps of things. Very weird looking compound, right? Got pluses and minuses, got oxygens bound to each other, all these kind of things. Ozone is pretty darn important though. And we do have this thing called an ozone layer, right? <laughs> kind of, you know, keeps life the way it is. Is ozone naturally occurring? 
better hope so, otherwise we'd have to explain how we get an ozone layer, right? Uh, <laughs> right? Ozone's naturally occurring, though. That's interesting. Ozone is an allotrope of oxygen, right? A naturally occurring form of oxygen. Yeah, you guys already knew that, right? You guys already knew what an allotrope is. What's diamond? That's an allotrope of carbon. What's graphite? Got it, right? So there's different elemental forms of atoms, of molecules, right? Ozone's naturally occur. You can buy an ozone generator and put it in your house. Don't, but you could, okay? <laughs> and people are like, oh, it kills bacteria and stuff in the air. They're right, it sure does. <laughs> it will, right? But um, waters, certain waters are purified by ozone analysis. I think Aquafina used to. It might, I don't know what your, your guys' water bottles, but it says it on the side there what it's purified with. But yeah, yours says purified by dry means. Ugh, throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say? Reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis, yeah. That's kind of the preferred method that they have there. It is ozonated. Woo! I'm finally not wrong. Thanks for saving me with that. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, it says it on there, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right? But uh, it is a very common method that they use to purify water because literally you just buy one of these ozone generators and you bubble it through water and it kills all the bacterial and organic stuff that's in there. Okay? And then you don't have to worry about it. You can drink it, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? But how does this look? Well, you guys see how kind of the shape of this ozone here looks very similar to what we saw before, right? With the, right, if I just cover up, oh, well, I can't, I was about to do something dumb. <laughs> if I cover up that end of it, you guys see what I'm talking about? The shape looks very similar there, right? So we expect to see, I was like, hey, you guys see it? <laughs> 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 it's a long, too long semester, quick pick that. But, uh, right, so we'll expect to see kind of the same, the same thing happen here, right? So a uh, pi bond goes here, right? Uh, we see this. And we see that kind of fall down there, right? And so at the end of this, what we would see is a carbon bound to a carbon, green, red, 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 and green like that, okay? And then it does some weird stuff, okay? So let me show you guys the weird stuff that happens, and I'll explain a little bit why, not that you guys need to know this, okay? So see if you guys can follow those arrows, though, and look at what happens. our carbon-carbon bond, right? And turns into a bond between what? Carbon and oxygen. Arrow number two breaks our oxygen-oxygen bond. And arrow three makes another bond between oxygen and carbon. Now, something that's going to become more and more important as we go forward, especially in the second semester, is that you have to understand that oxygen and carbon are bestest buds, okay? They really like each other. So making carbon-oxygen bonds is a good thing, thermodynamically, okay? Carbon-oxygen bonds are really strong. Carbon-oxygen double bonds are super strong. And there's a strong driving force to make carbon-oxygen double bonds, okay? Now, oxygen doesn't like to be bound to itself. So breaking the oxygen-oxygen bond there, number two, is actually a good thing, okay? Why? Because then it can start to hog electrons from something else, 
Okay? So anytime you see an oxygen bound to another oxygen, it's a pretty reactive species. In fact, what do we call when an oxygen is bound to another oxygen with a single bond? For the instance of something like this. Let's say we have this molecule right here. What would that be called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is our buddy hydrogen per oxide. Whenever you see the word per oxide, it means there's an oxygen-oxygen single bond in there, okay? We're gonna be bringing that idea back in just a little bit also, okay? So a per oxide is an oxygen bound to another oxygen through a single bond. Sounds good? And then this does weird stuff, okay? It makes a five-membered ring with three oxygens bound in different, it's, it just does some crazy stuff. Don't need you guys to know it. It's in the book, you can take a look at it. It shows the arrows. The arrows make sense, that's not what I mean by weird stuff, it's just not expected from what we see from the other mechanisms that we know, okay? But it's there. Okay. How did this end up? Yeah. It ends up, I was trying to just show you guys how it splits apart to that, right? This will make something weird happen and then another weird thing will happen. Two points I wanted to show you guys is we see a very similar setup to the osmium tetroxide in the KMnO4, right? And then I wanted to introduce the idea of carbon oxygen bonds being a good driving force for a reaction. Those are the two ideas I want you guys to get out of that this morning. And that ozone is cool, but not the green bit. Little exam, yes. <laughs> That's shooting the lab. Should I breathe ozone? Not today. <laughs> Maybe when my student loan check comes in. <laughs> All right. Okay, so see what you guys come up with for that problem there. Okay. Snip, slide, and slap. Snip my double bonds. Oops, I didn't leave myself enough space here. I just snip my double bonds, I slide them apart, and I oxygen it up. And then I grimace at my poor drawing. Gross. So I make it look nice and pretty. Like that. Cut all your double bonds, slap oxygens, make it look nice, right?
seems like kind of the touching up the last of those reactions in chapter eight there. Um, and it seems like a good place that we'll end it for today here uh, a little bit early. So you guys can go, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Find some ozone. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm not alive, I don't have to take the game. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have this at all. But, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so if you, I'll be around if you guys have any questions. What did I say the time it's due? What is it? Four, Four o'clock. Okay. I'll make it earlier so Annie gets screwed over. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you see, you heard her. She doesn't want to do in five minutes. But I'll be around. So if you guys have any questions, come by and ask me. Right? Hey, Dr. H, does it look like I'm on the right track? I'll say yes or no and ask you some questions to put you on the right track if you're off. Okay? I'm here to help you guys out. But guess what I can't do? Read your minds, and I can't help you when. After the exam's turned in. Got it? So when should you come and ask for help? Okay? Cool. All right, I'll see you guys.